Welcome in, everybody, to the flagship podcast interview. So excited today to bring in Fox, lead college football analyst. Uh, and really, he does it all. I mean, I've seen him do golf. I've seen him do <laughs> stuff. He's done it all. He's played baseball. He led Colorado to the Big 12 championship game. They haven't done anything Ugh. since, as, as my memory serves. The one True. and only Joel Klatt. Joel, how you doing? Good man. How are you? It's good to see you, by the way. It's good to see you too. You you've been a uh, a friend for gosh over a decade. I after know you were on 104.3 The Fan, dude. How about that? I remember those days, and I was just the guy. Everyone was like, everyone you know from Texas, was like, wait, weren't you the quarterback that? And I'm like, yes, yes, I, I was the guy that lost to Texas 70 to three. See, I didn't even bring that up, but what I brought up was Colorado hasn't done anything since they have left. Man, they've been they've struggled. They had the one year they they qualified, qualified. They won their division and played for the Pac-12 championship game, uh, but they they lost that to Washington. I believe it was Washington, and then they lost the Alamo Bowl to Oklahoma State. You know, so but other than that, they just they haven't done anything, man. It's and then now that conference is in a precarious spot. A really precarious spot with where um, we are at with the USC and UCLA move. Right. Fox is the king of the Big Ten. They've added the Los Angeles market. You, of course, are the king of Fox. So <laughs> you've got USC and UCLA uh, games that you'll be you'll be doing. I'm worried about you not doing many more Big Twelve games in the future. Oh, but we'll get to that, Joel. I'm I'm so I'm already so bummed just about like I don't know how many chances I'll get to call a Red River game. Maybe I've called my last one. I don't know how many more times I'm going to be able to come down to Austin, depending on when all these conference you know shifts take place. So I'm very much looking forward to this Bama game. I'll be in town for the Bama game, um, and I love coming to Austin. Uh, obviously, you guys know it's a great place, but just you know, I really hope for. Texas to be a better, more influential program in the sport. They need to be for the sport to be as healthy as we we hope it can be moving forward. Okay, we're going to get to Texas, and of course you'll be at the Texas-Alabama game. But I want to ask you, as a broadcaster, mm -hmm. who's, who's the guy or gal in broadcasting that you look at and say, man, they've done it right that would be really cool to have a career similar to theirs. Hmm. You know that we get lumped all together, but they're such different roles, right? So uh, I, if you're just looking at it from my standpoint, I would just, let's take everybody out of the equation except for football analysts. Um, and, you know, I, it's, I've gotten to know Troy really well and i think that he's done a remarkable job for a long time so troy aikman is is that type of guy uh that i look at and then for me not having a gold jacket or a super bowl ring or a heisman trophy or anything a guy that has been a real kind of i would say beacon not only for the sport of college football but for someone to take a path that I have now taken, and he paved that path as Kirk Herbstreet. And now he's going to be doing NFL games on, a, on Thursday night on Amazon, which, which is remarkable. So his path and career, I think, has, has gone past what even he envisioned at the beginning. And, and it's certainly something that I uh, look at and, and gives me great you know, hope in – the longevity I can hopefully have and, and the aspirations that I have in, in this business. So, so those two in particular, and then just from, from everybody, there's so many people that do it right now. I would just, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Gus and Jenny, who I work with. Jenny is as a good a teammate as I've ever had in any sport work setting, anything. She's incredibly prepared, hardworking. And Gus is as talented a person as I have ever worked with, whether it was playing team sports or now in a work setting. And I've learned so much from each of them, but those two, you know, I can't tell you how lucky I am to work with each of them on a week in and week out basis. Well, I think you can do it all. So I, I look at you and see, you know, like an Al Michaels type of guy. So, um, listen, 
let's get to let's see do i what do i want to do first do i want to do big picture college football or we'll save texas okay. for after our little mini break so you and i always kind of have our conversation once a year about where the bleep college football is going now we've got mm -hmm. usc and ucla going to the big 10. yeah uh, texas and ou went you know whatever they committed to the sec in the class of probably 2024. how is espn gonna start their broadcast rights for sec football without texas and oklahoma in the fall of 2024. that's that's all i'm saying they won't. Uh, plus now usc and ucla are starting in the big 10 in 2024. Right. so right. i you and i've been talking about you know could we ever get to collective bargaining for the power five good gravy joel the i mean now that the the Big Ten and the SEC are so far ahead, it seems like we can't bring along the others to to have collective bargaining and equal revenue sharing. It seems like those days are gone. I've been talking about them since 2011, but yeah. are, we, are those days toast? How many, how many well, are going to be in the elite of college football, the, the top? It's a good tier? question. So there's, there's a lot of discussion about um, and speculation that this is all the start of the process into super conferences, two or three. I don't see it that way. And the reason is, is because um, there has to be incentive or a catalyst for those super conferences. What is the benefit of a super conference? What are the downsides of a super conference? And I'm talking about this from a real like macro level. So why would a president vote to include schools in their conference or not uh, or, or vote no to include schools in their conference? And I will tell you that after a lot of thought and, and really long discussions with a lot of people within the sport and within television networks, I don't think we're headed to super conferences. Um, that is a minority opinion. Um, but the strength is not in the numbers. The strength of conferences is, is in the value. And those are two different things. And so let's put it to you this way. There's been speculation that the Big Ten was going to be aggressive. And maybe even they thought in their mind, like, hey, wouldn't it be great if like, we could also include a few more West Coast teams and then we could own the whole day of college football and have four broadcast windows? And there's all these, these you know, thoughts that you could have about maybe we should grow. But in order to grow, you have to get a 75% vote or higher. I don't know the exact number, but I believe it's 75% vote or higher of all the presidents and cha or chancellors to vote to include or invite those extra schools in. When you really boil it down, those presidents or, or chancellors are going to be looking at bottom lines. Okay. And Chip, you know this, right? Like deep down, you know this. It's about the revenue distribution. And if you're going to vote to bring more schools in just to say that you're a super conference, you're going to have to dilute your own revenue share. I do not see a situation or a scenario where a president will sit down and be asked to vote to bring a school in, and that vote would dilute that president's share of revenue within the conference. That, to me, that's just not going to happen. So you can talk all you want about, well, we're headed to super conferences and there's no spot for this team and that team. And clearly they're going to have to do. No, clearly they don't have to do that because it really comes down to revenue distribution. And and I think that this is the same case in the SEC as well. People have speculated like clearly Clemson is going to be an SEC team. Really? Really? In order for Clemson to be an SEC team, the SEC would have to go to their television broadcast partner and say, hey, we want to add this school. What would that do to our media rights deal? That provider already owns Clemson games. Every one of them. ESPN. Yep. So why would ESPN be incentivized to pay more 
for the exact same game to select the exact same game, they 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 wouldn't. They wouldn't. Now maybe you could argue. Well, it Not gives you a potential. Well, at least until 2036. And then we can rediscuss and re- re- redefine what this is at that point. But I'm just saying in the next 10 years, it just to me doesn't make sense. You're going to have to have presidents vote to dilute their own share in order to grow into these super conferences. So let me go back to my first answer. I don't think we're getting to a super conference. I think that we're getting to two major conferences, the SEC and the Big Ten, which will dictate uh, the way that college athletics and more particular uh, football moves and where it goes and what the postseason structure is going to be. And they'll be the power players. Now, that's a totally different discussion than you bringing up collective bargaining. And collective bargaining is something something that I think is going to need to take place in order to get any type of guardrails on the current NIL landscape. Uh, right now, the, the, the name, image, and likeness issue is being taken advantage of what it was intended for and what it is being used for are two totally different things the ncaa has been completely neutered by court decisions over the last five and six years so they don't feel like they have any authority okay they don't they can't they don't feel like they can go in and govern with a heavy hand because of these court cases they feel like they're just going to wind up back in court paying lawyers and litigating over over antitrust issues in which it's already been laid out pretty clearly by the Supreme Court. Like, we're not going to rule in your favor. (laughs) Okay, so the NCAA doesn't have any governance power. So at that point, the rules for NIL are supposed to also be governed by things like, hey, you can't tamper, you can't induce, boosters can't be involved. We have definitions for all of these things and uh, penalties for acting within those those avenues, and yet they're not being enforced. So it's more of an enforcement issue than it is anything else. Well, how do you enforce the rules? I see the only way that we enforce the rules is one of two roads. Either you collectively bargain with the, the student athletes, and then you, you basically say, this is what we can and can't do, and then they agree to it, or you've got to have federal legislation. Between the two, I think that the most feasible route is going to be collectively bargaining with the players. The hardest part is trying to organize 18 to 22-year-olds that are going to be gone from that association after four and five years, three years in some cases. So how do you organize them in that short amount of time? I believe that the catalyst for organization for the players has to be the college football coaches. The College Football Coaches Association, I believe, has to take the players under their wing and then start to collectively bargain on their behalf uh, with a few of those players that can be representatives as well during their playing days. Long answer to tell you, I don't think we're going to super conferences. And the only way that we get any sort of structure as it relates to NIL and what's going on right now is if we collectively bargain with the players. So do you think, getting back to the short term, do you think that the Pac-12 then uh, or the 10, the Pac-10 will take the ESPN offer? I think it's like 12 years, 32 million per school. It'll probably end up with the the ACC network and the Pac-12 network sharing their third tier rights through 2036. And then I I don't think they'll do that long of a of a deal. Everyone wants a six or seven year deal because the Big Ten is doing it short. Uh, remember now, this is not the NFL. These are not shrewd businessmen that we have academics and academics are in love with theory and textbooks. That's the reason why the PAC 12 is in their situation that they are, because they thought owning a hundred percent of something that has very little value was worse or excuse me, better than owning 49% of something that has massive value. So the big 10 did it right. The PAC 12 did not. Why? Because the PAC 12 was governed by academics and people that were in love with textbooks and theory um, and not business and actual business. Um, so it's a monkey see monkey do business right now. And, and I think that everyone's going to say like, well, the big 10 did it this way. So this is the way that we should do it. I don't know if that that's going to help them or not. I will, I will tell you that it seems like the conference that everyone is trying to get out of the fastest is the pack 12 now 10. That's the one that's on the most precarious ground is, and it, and it's because none of them trust each other. See in the big 12, and I'm talking about minus Oklahoma and Texas, right? The future Big 12. So now we're talking in future sense. The future Big 12 
They trust each other. Why? No one's coming for them. Right? Like, there's an understanding of who they are. You got to know who you are before you know you, where you're going to go. And the Big 12, I feel like, has a somewhat of an understanding of who they are. The ACC has an understanding of who they are, eh, more so not because no one wants their teams, but because of the length of their grant of rights deal. So there's a financial barrier to anyone moving. So they kind of know who they are. Then there's the Pac-12. And at the drop of a hat, any one of them will jump at a better offer. So there's no trust within the constituents. And, and that's the reason that they're on the most precarious ground. Now, whether that's going to happen for them or not remains to be seen. The cards are in the Big Ten's hands. If they wanted Washington and Oregon and Cal and Stanford, they could have them. They could have them tomorrow. But they're going to have to have their presidents vote to dilute their shares, which I just don't see that happening. So now Oregon and, and the other schools are going to have to go back to the table and say, no, 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 we're committed to this. Well, how do you think Arizona feels about that? Top tier basketball school, they could go join Kansas and Baylor and Texas Tech and, and form one of the best basketball conferences maybe that we've got in the land and join what, at least in theory, or at least what seems to be a more stable conference in the Big 12. They could take ASU, although there's some infighting between the two. They could take the mountain schools, Utah and Colorado, and go to the Big 12. So the precarious spot right now is the West. What's happening? Oregon State and Washington State seem to be totally on the outs. They're going to be the ones pounding the table to try to stay together. Let's take the 32, 35 million from the ESPN right now. Let's let's do a deal. Let's maybe bring in Apple. Who knows what they can possibly get? But that's kind of where I see everything right now. Yeah, I mean it's fascinating. And remember, after Larry Scott tried to get the six schools from the Big 12 in 2010, Oklahoma tried to go to the Pac-12. With Oklahoma State and the Pac-12 would not take them without Texas. Think about yeah, that. Yeah, listen, now. the Pac-12, from the point that the Pac-16 didn't happen, for whatever reason, and you you probably know way more about why it didn't than I do. From my understanding, it didn't happen because it became public. And then it didn't happen. Um, it, it probably is way more than that. Having said that, from that moment, it seemed like the Pac-12 was on a trajectory up to that moment. It's like, hey, man, they're, they're going to be a serious player. They're going to get these schools. They're going to do a great deal. They're going to have a network. They're the ones that they were on a, a, a road to become kind of the Big Ten of the West, right? This power player in the West, and we'd have three power players, right? And then it didn't happen for whatever reason. And every decision from that point on for about the next two or three years was an abject failure. They did not get distribution on their network. Their network was 100% owned by the conference, not with a, distribu uh, a distribution partner like Comcast or Fox or someone like BTN was. So they didn't get distribution like the SEC network was, like Longhorn Network is. Um, all of those things were a mistake, a huge mistake. And by the way, in hindsight, not giving USC a larger share of the revenue is why they're in the position that they're in. Spending the money that they did in San Francisco on their corporate offices, conference offices, rather than doing something in Vegas or in some place that's a lower cost, paying himself what he did and Larry Scott. I mean, he made mistake after mistake after mistake, and it's the reason that the Pac-12 is now imploding and is in the current state that it's in. Well, We'll take a quick break with Joel Klatt, uh, the lead college football analyst for Fox. Uh, and if you are watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we will roll on. All right. So, Joel, you mentioned it. You're coming to Austin for Texas, Alabama. Yeah. And Alabama. Do you think Nick Saban was the coach who voted Texas number one, by the way? Or do you think it was someone who meant I to want, type I in? want that to be the I, I, I want that to be the case. Yeah. I think someone probably meant to type in Texas A&M. Yeah, and it something happened, you know. But A and um, who's in, in your mind, top let's, four? I I have I have changed that. That was a oh. long time ago. Okay. I'm coming out with a new top ten before the season. I've moved A and M down to eight. Okay, because of the quarterback. Yes, and just like you know, when you really dive in and 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 you start realizing that the off season in the off season the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And gets the attention. And boy, AM is really good at being the squeaky wheel. You and I both know it. 
They love being the squeaky wheel, in particular for a program that has achieved virtually nothing for a long time. Seven, 75 years. I mean, I I'm not trying to be mean. I'm like these, these right. are just like factual statements, right? I'm I'm a football analyst. They weren't even great in their own division. What did they? I mean, they were four and four in the SEC, I believe, last year. So you know, this hype is based on recruiting, and I understand that. I really do because they've recruited as well as anybody. In fact, I believe last year's class was the best class to have ever been signed. Having said that, you know, um, they've still got to go out and prove it. So me putting them even inside the top 10 is an acknowledgement of what they've done from a recruiting perspective. But to put them in the top five, I just kind of rethought that. I saw what they've got coming back. I saw how many of the young players that they're going to be leaning on and hoping that they contribute. Then you start talking about team chemistry and what really is going on with all these NIL deals. Where's the money? Who's getting paid? Who knows what's going on? So I moved them down to eight. Yeah, and that's a that's the next wave of all of this. But Jimbo Fisher, and by the way, I just did a podcast with Terry Bowden, ah. who I didn't realize was the head coach at Samford and recruited <laughs> Jimbo Fisher as his oh, quarterback wow. at Samford. That? But Jimbo at the quarterback position, you know, he had Jameis, but you're like, you know, Lincoln Riley brings in a new quarterback every year they get drafted. In the, yep. you know, first round and and on and on. Caleb Williams looks, is a monster. Ask Texas fans. The guy totally turned the game last year. But Jimbo's quarterbacks have not been just those war daddies, Joel. I but, don't think that they protect the quarterback well. Okay. I don't think his system protects the quarterback well. And I think that their quarterbacks get gun shy. Jameis was rare, man. And it didn't matter. But and by the way, you saw his play decline. In his college yeah. years. That, I mean, that's just statistically true. Yep. So, you know, that's something that, that Jimbo has done a really poor job of. There are far better offensive coaches in college football, um, in particular at the quarterback spot. Ryan Day, what he does at Ohio State. Yep. You can't argue with what he's doing. Lincoln Riley obviously comes to mind. And then <laughs> people will hate to say this, but look at what Nick Saban is doing with quarterbacks. Unbelievable. Now, I know that he specifically is not doing it, but his program is. Right. And, and he was the and guy that the said, we can't spread it out. Guys are going to get worn out. All these plays, up-tempo, all this stuff. Look at him. He's spreading and, it and, out. He'll go up-tempo. And his acknowledgement as a defensive coach that the style of game is is changing and, and doing what he did. In fact, look at – just back in, what was it, 2017, they gave up about 12 points a game defensively. And that was a great team. But remember, they lost to Auburn. And, you know, you look at what they have done since. They gave up 18, 18 and a half, 19 and a half, and 20. So I'm not saying his defenses are getting worse. It's the exact opposite. You look at what they're doing offensively. 2017, they scored 37 right around there. Then they went 45, 47, 48, 40. So they just transformed into a team that wasn't looking for A.J. McCarron to not make mistakes. They were looking for players to go out there and make the plays. Be the Joe Burrow. Be the guy that can go and be uh, uh, the, the instigator, the above the X's and O's player, and they've been able to find that. Mac Jones did that for him. Tua did that for him at times, and obviously Bryce is doing that for him. A&M does not have that. They don't have that. They have not had anywhere close – uh, to that type of quarterback play since Johnny, and he did it for the one year for Kevin, and, and it hasn't even been close since. So in order to beat Alabama, may, folks, all right, A&M folks, and I, you probably don't have a ton of A&M folks, but your Texas fans are going to well, eat this up. They, they listen. A&M, you're going down a road more like Georgia and less like Alabama. Because you don't have the quarterback that's going to take over a game. In order to beat Alabama with that blueprint, Stetson Bennett at quarterback, you have to have a defense that had, what was it, six first-rounders, six draft picks, whatever. I mean, I, off the top of my head, it, I mean, historically great defense. 
And even then, that defense got lit up in the SEC championship game. And if Jamison Williams doesn't tear up his knee, you can't tell me that Bama wouldn't have won the national championship last year. In fact, the only reason that Bama was in the position that they were in that game against Georgia is because Mechie wasn't on the field and Williams wasn't on the field. And, and the rest of their wide receiver core failed miserably. It was the reason they lost, is their wide receiver core was not detailed, they were not disciplined, and they did not make plays for Bryce Young. That's why they lost. So unless AM has that guy at quarterback, you're not even getting out of your own division. It's just not happening. Yeah. I, I agree. Now that leads us to Steve Sarkeesian, who this offseason mm-hmm. has been saying uh, Nick Saban in his first year at Alabama, seven and six, lost to Louisiana Monroe. Pete Carroll in his first year at USC went six and six. And then both programs went to the moon. Whew. So, by the way, I, I played that USC. I was a freshman at Colorado. We played Pete's second USC team before they were really anything. Are you familiar like the Carson Palmer? Oh, two. Yeah. Carson O2. Palmer's Heisman year. His Heisman year. And they weren't anything. It was just the beginning of the year, kind of. And USC mm-hmm. came in. And Troy Palomalu, we played him in Boulder, was like a, a rolling ball of butcher knives. And I just remember being like, oh my gosh, this team is really good. So to your point, yes, like these teams were shot out of a cannon. Bob Stoops in his second year, he comes out shot out of a cannon. Nick Saban, look what he's done. 15th straight year that. They're going to be ranked number one at some point in the AP poll. So if he's going to bring up these these instances, boy, it better work out because you can't bring these up and just be like, hey, eight wins is good enough. So Steve's playing with fire when he kind of brings up that type of comparison, which he, by the way, he should. I mean, I'm just saying that that's that's risky. Right. That that gives the fan base all kinds of, you know, touchy feelies. But what surprised you most? You guys are you guys are so. That's all you, know, you got. Texas like, fans, you love the touchy feelies. Uh, you really do. You just want to feel good about your program. You need more guys like, oh, he's over there. That guy. Hey, man, that dude. That dude was a absolute gangsta. Um, okay, but Steve Sarkeesian, what surprised you most, Joel, about year one for Sarkeesian at Texas? Pete Kwiatkowski's inability to play second half defense. It wasn't really Steve. I thought the offense was fine, yeah. really. Um, but they gave up 31 points a game. Uh, I did the Oklahoma State game. They desperately need a stop. Going to lose the game if they don't get a stop. Oklahoma State's going to run the football. Period. 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 They had two safeties back, and they hand the ball off, and he gets a first down. And I'm like, I mean, I don't know if you remember during the call, I lost my mind. As much as I'll lose my mind during a game, I was like, what what, what are we doing? What's happening? You can't do that. So that was I, – I was most surprised at that. Um, and, and it goes back to I thought Steve should have kept Chris Ash because I thought that they were playing better defense towards the end of that previous season than, than some – think um i know that's not popular but i saw them play late against kansas state i saw some of the things that that iowa state team was a really good team they lost by three in a close game um going back to 2020 and i just thought that their defense was on the right track and then another defensive coordinator another voice and then the inability to transition and scheme in the second half was my biggest issue with texas last year yeah and now you bring in gary patterson as a special assistant you and i both know that's going to go one of two ways if (laughs) the defense is playing well great if they're not that becomes garbage can you know slamming for gary patterson whose scheme is totally different from pk's yeah like even if you dumped PK three, four games into the season and went to Patterson's defense. I don't know. That would, that just seems like a non starter, but that's how the fans are going to think Joel. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be, I wouldn't want to be Pete. 
I wouldn't want to be PK in this situation. That's yeah. a that's a no win situation, and they're going to have to play well. Oh, and by the way, in the second week of the season, they're going to have to see an offense that is ridiculously good. That will show us either how far they have to go or how far they've come. Well, will it? Right? Like, here's the thing. I think Texas could be vastly improved defensively and still just guys like Bryce and Jameer Gibbs and what they do offensively, their offensive line, what they're going to be able to do running the football and throwing the football. Like, I don't know if that's a good measuring stick. And I think that I think Texas fans would would do a disservice to themselves this year of measuring their their defensive improvement on the second week of the season against that Alabama offense. I think that's a disservice. You want to measure them against something? Go measure them down the line when you're playing Oklahoma and Iowa State and Oklahoma State and and these other teams. Like, are they improving through the season? But man, week two to come out here and just like face that team, I'm not. I don't know. That's that's interesting. And by the way, it presents all sorts of stress on your camp when you've got to get ready for that game. Your fan base wants it to be a measuring stick game, and you've got to get ready for that game early. Yeah, you have ULM, but man, there's no room for error. Do you know why you get injuries? Is because you got to practice too hard in camp because you have to get ready for that week two game. If you have three cupcakes. There's no way that you practice hard enough to have all of those injuries. You look at the injuries across college football, generally speaking, not every single one, but generally speaking, they happen to teams that have a really tough week one or week two matchup because the the, the head coach, because there's no preseason, is forced into a scenario where he has to practice harder than he wants to. It's a constant tug of war for a coach. How hard do we go? Do we need to lay off? Are we ready? Are we not ready? We don't know. And when you got Alabama week two, you always kind of push the envelope a little bit, and that's how you wind up with injuries. Well, I know we've we've kept you, um, and I could talk to you all day. What you, you said you got a new top ten coming out. Who wins the Big Twelve in twenty twenty two? Joel Klatt. I don't have a Big Twelve team in my top ten. Yeah. Is that bad? Uh, no, because. You look at what they got their way coming into back. your top ten, man. I people are high on Oklahoma. Great, they've had so much success. They lost a ton of people, whether it's graduation or transfers. They lost their head coach. They lost their defensive coordinator. I, you know, like Kennedy Brooks was the one thing that I would always look at and be like, "Hey, man, I I know he's going to show up." Yeah, he's not there anymore. Like. I don't know. Is it Baylor? They lost a ton. They won a lot of close games. Can you rely on all those close wins? I love what Dave Aranda is doing defensively. They don't have Jalen Petrie anymore. He was a game changer. You look at Oklahoma State. They lose all of those experienced players off their defense, including losing their coordinator, Jim Knowles, who now goes to Ohio State. I think their offense could be better. But remember, they won in spite of their offense last year, not because of it. You right. know, So telling me that all those guys are back, doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in what they have moving forward. You look at Texas, massive question marks. Hate the injury to Junior Ongolau, who gets an ACL. They were already talking about and probably going to start a true freshman. It might be two now, right, yeah. Chip? Yes. I mean, you might have two true freshmen out there against Will Anderson. Good luck. Kansas State, I mean, are they going to win the conference? I think Deuce Vaughn's probably the best player on that team and maybe the second best player in the conference to be John Robinson, but – I. So those are your contenders, man. I mean, Iowa State lost everything that they had. They had the most experienced team. If you pin me down, I would say Oklahoma, but only because of history. I have no idea how Oklahoma is going to play. I'm going to see them week three. Their their schedule is is decent, but I don't know what they're going to be. Man, they've been relying on Lincoln Riley's offense for a long time, and now they don't have it. Um, We'll see how they go. Yeah. No, it's it's great stuff. All right, you coming down uh, to Texas? You're coming down September 10th for Texas Alabama. That's it. You coming? Yes, that's sir. it. Well, at least for now, I'll probably okay. get another one. I'm not sure when or where. Okay. I wish I was doing Red River, but I'm not. Yeah. Well, listen, Joel Clatt, I love catching up with you. 
I mean, you've come a long way since 1043 <laughs> the fan in Denver. Ain't that the truth? You were since good on the radio. I mean, now well, you're I, even I better on TV. That. You know what I mean? I don't know about that. I, there, you got to have brains to be on the radio. <laughs> well, that's an ender, folks. Um, for Joel Klatt, I'm Chip Brown. Thanks so much for listening to the flagship podcast interview. Joel Klatt, we'll see you September 10th. You got it, bud. See you. All right, everybody take care. Stay safe and keep the faith.